Hi everybody, welcome. Let's get now. No mic. Okay. <laughs> you can you can hear me? Good. Barely. No. Uh, it's okay. No. Thank you. Hi everybody, welcome. <laughs> I'm sorry, that was too loud. loud. I hope you had a good uh, lunch break. Uh, we'll get started with our next talk. Uh, it is helping your organization build their security brand. Uh, so please welcome our speakers, Leif Dreisler and Colleen Coolidge. Over to you, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, everyone. Uh, this is your ad here, helping your organization build their security brand. I'm Leif. <clears throat> I've spent the last decade working in security, and B-Sides Las Vegas was actually the first conference that I attended in 2013, uh, so it's cool to be back as a speaker. I'm currently an engineering manager at SEMGRIP. We're an AppSec vendor focused on static analysis and software composition analysis, and we have a booth here at B-Sides on the opposite uh, end of the, the hall, so check that out if you want some swag. I'm also the co-host of uh, the HIT podcast, 404 Security Not Found. We get about 100 listeners a month. Um, and we do, uh, we do news and uh, discussion episodes. Sometimes we have special guests, but uh, it's pretty fun. I've also been uh, a CFP reviewer for AppSec California and LocomocoSec, which is probably some of the more relevant experience for this talk. And before SEMGREP, I joined SegMint. Uh, in 2017 as an AppSec engineer and later went on to lead a team focused on building security features as well as internal security tools, which is where I met Colleen. And a little bit about me. I currently advise startups on security strategy and try to help the first security hire uh, promote their agenda and like push back on the pushback that they get. I've been practicing security for about two decades now, uh, working in most of the security domains. Um, I've also been a CISO at both private companies that are small and larger public companies. Um, and if I'm honest, I really, really love pre-IPO way more. It's just, it's just a better experience for me. Um, but anywhere I lead security, I highly encourage folks to do blogs, podcasts, and talks whenever possible. And I lead by example by doing my share of the conference talks, keynotes, and podcasts. Um, and I've been inspired to do even more because of people like Leaf. So thank you, Leaf. We've broken up this talk for you into four sections. First, Leaf is gonna start with the benefits of all teams being more engaged with the security community. Next, I'll cover how to foster a culture of rewards to keep the benefits flowing. Then Leaf will show you how to optimize the benefits by amplifying all this good work by your team. And last, we'll both cover the different ways that you can show up in the community, so blogs, podcasts, and talks, and how to prep for them. Uh, and a quick PSA, we've included a link to the slides here. Um, so I'll give you a second to take a photo. Um, that way you don't have to take notes, you can just absorb. And as we're going through this and you're absorbing, if you've been putting off your next community piece of engagement, consider this your friendly nudge from some friends. Um, make notes during our presentation, You know whether you have an idea for a blog or you think you could get on a podcast or do a talk. What could you start working on today? And that's exactly how anyone gets started on this stuff. Um, I'll wind down this little intro with a disclaimer. Um, while some of the most successful InfoSec folks that, that we've ever worked with or we know do periodically share their work, they make time for it. We know a few people who have had absolutely stellar record shattering careers, but they never do this. Maybe they've never written an article, maybe they've never set foot on stage. Um, they could be highly effective managers or ICs who just maybe haven't had any time. Um, or maybe they work for an organization that actively discourages or penalizes sharing information. Um, maybe they work for the government, so. Uh, or they could work for Apple, uh, not the government. But if you've had friends or family who worked at Apple, you know, you can see that they are definitely not encouraged to share the inside workings of company security with the rest of the world for obvious reasons, and that's okay. It's not for everyone. <clears throat> I'm going to start us off today by talking about the benefits of having your teams more engaged with the security community. Having a public persona really, really helps with recruiting, which helps you build your security dream team. Working with great people makes your job a lot easier. It also makes it a lot more enjoyable. See a lot of people that we have worked with in the crowd, uh, which is great. Um, but it also takes a lot of effort because usually these are people that other people also want to work with. And so you're competing for the best people. 
Uh, I think there's a lot of overlap between recruiting and sales. And you can think of your blogs and presentations as your marketing department because it makes better candidates come inbound and it also helps recruiters reach out to people and have them actually respond to their cold emails. It's a lot easier if they've like actually heard that your team is good uh, and working on cool stuff than just uh, you know the million other emails they're getting. And I think that having blogs and conference presentations go live around the same time that you're trying to post roles is also helpful because uh, the timing just helps drive traffic to your jobs page and just makes people more aware. And I think a lot of recruiting is also timing. So having someone be aware of your company and having a recruiter reach out is a pretty good combo. Um, and with that in mind, we have a lot of open roles at SEMGREP, but I wanted to highlight <laughs> just one, which is uh, a security engineering manager for a vulnerability research team. It's my personal mission to find a great candidate for the hiring manager. Uh, this week, I am convinced that they exist in Vegas. Um, and you should definitely work for SEMGREP. There's a lot of cool people there, so FYI. Um, the InfoSec community is super small, and orgs that publish their work come up more frequently in conversations when people are thinking about where to work next. I'm sure the Netflix team gets a lot more inbound interest than the NBC Peacock team when a, they open up a role. And you might be thinking, well, Netflix probably pays twice as much, and that's probably true. But we didn't pay anywhere near what Netflix paid at Segment, and we were able to build a pretty awesome team that people from Netflix admired. And I attribute a lot of that to our involvement in the community. Community involvement shows that your team is working on cool stuff, is given time to write and blog about it, as well as travel to speak at conferences, and that they have at least a decent learning and development budget to be able to go and do these things. Uh, and these are things that a lot of security people, uh, probably a lot of you in this room, want from their employer, and so showing that you have that is a good way to attract people to join you. So here's another benefit. It transforms all of us from being like maybe painfully awkward, that's how I was, and unwilling communicators to being effective and powerful communicators at our own jobs. All companies say security is very important to us, but you on the inside know things like how often do folks at your company actually fall in line? Instead, do they actually admit, admit, sorry, omit security work from their quarterly planning? Do they ignore your tickets? Do they get exceptions and otherwise get out of doing the security work? While this is likely due to multiple reasons, what you can control is the effectiveness of your messaging. Security folks tend to be correct, right? We research things, we make sure that it's like all ready to go, this piece of information. But we can also come across as disgruntled sometimes, or we might bury the lead, or we avoid giving frequent, loud and clear messaging to eng teams. Um, or execs, and all of those groups definitely need to be frequently nudged. And that hampers us from communicating danger and the need for quick action when something needs to get done. So in this section, I'll talk about how to shift your culture a bit so that teams improve their communication, which will lead to getting more done and team members getting rewarded. So some of you might be thinking, sure, I can do this, it's not a problem. But what is my manager doing to start recognizing and rewarding this behavior? This is extra work. Or maybe you're that manager who isn't supporting this effort on your team. Shame, shame. As a CISO, I've always emphasized that sharing work internally and externally is a key growth indicator in our job ladders and in our org because it's core to getting stuff done. It was a hard requirement at Segment, and while it was extra work for all of us, it definitely provided us with dividends. And we also created infrastructure to support it because you have to. All right, I'll start with leaders. Leaders. How can you expect your teams to hustle if you're not hustling first, internally and externally? Inside your company, never miss a chance to broadcast your team's good work and successes. When's the last time you wrote a series of security slacks to your company, or got up and spoke in front of engineering, or at all hands? How often do you do this? Or do you just sort of pawn it off on your teams and hope they do it? Unfortunately, you're a leader, it means you gotta go first, you like get the baton, go do it, hand it off, and eventually the baton comes back to you and you have to do it again, um, but that's the way it goes. And outside the company, if it's been like over a year since you've either blogged or, or spoke, your team needs to see you blogging and or speaking in order to emulate it. Otherwise, they're gonna emulate you not doing anything. That's bad. Um, so then once you're, you're doing that, they're doing that, then you're like, shoot, we need to like advertise a little bit. Um, 
So once you're doing this, do you have a culture to support it and sustain it? You know, like, do you just do it once and then nobody ever gets up and does it again? Are you in the audience cheering on everybody when they're doing it? Are you immediately amplifying people's work in Slack, uh, the company intranet or on LinkedIn or whatever social media? And are you encouraging others to cheerlead? It is an effort. I don't know if anyone's ever been a cheerleader before, but I think those folks are underpaid. It's a lot of work. Yeah, and paperwork sucks and you have a lot of it when you're a leader. Eh. But you can use it to change elements that positively influence your employees' behavior. So if your job ladder is something like this fake job ladder, um, you know, there are areas where you can state the different types of comms deliverables that you want to see from each level of employee, along with the frequency and the desired impact of that stuff. Um, you can think of this as like your success criteria for the communication and leadership vertical that you have on your team. Because then once you start filling this out, you can port over the entire row that your employee belongs to over to a career development plan. And it's like a CDP. And in the CDP, you can sort of collect a personalized checklist of work for this person based on that success criteria. And you can use the CDP during your one-on-one. See, paperwork helps. And then you could shade the different areas like red, yellow, or green, depending is the person trending away from this goal? Or are they trending toward the goal? Yeah, so that's so good. But what do you do about people who hide from their responsibilities? And they're, they're like, no, 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 the rest of you can go and speak and blog, and I'm just gonna go hide under here and do my job. Well, if you're a leader, you have to hold them accountable. That's the crap thing about being a leader. Um, so I recommend keeping this column red until the employee starts delivering. It will hold them back from going to the next level. I'm sorry. Because um, what you don't want is a situation where you have like two people, three people on your team who, who are carrying the heavy load of the comms and leadership stuff because it's demoralizing. They're working really hard and maybe they're progressing at the same rate that the person who's not doing it is. And once they get demoralized, what can they do? It's your best employee. They can leave you and you don't want that to happen. So for folks who do deliver, describe this work very detailed and in its impact in their annual review and promo packets. You'll see that great comms and leadership naturally leads to getting stuff done and high impact on the company. And remember to go and get praise from other people who've been impacted as well. And not everything is promo or money related. Your folks also wanna earn some gold stars from you. In your conversations with your employees, describe the comms leadership and impact growth that you are seeing in them, you know, before they started doing this to where they are today and how they're growing. Regular, regularly recognize them in Slack, LinkedIn, at your all hands, all of that, and then teach them how to self-promote. That'll help them with their career growth. And then when talking about your roadmap, link these very effective employees to the overall successes of your program. Maybe because of them, you shaved, what, one to two years off of your total roadmap? That is huge. That is a big differentiator for them. And that means that your employee who's doing this work is foundational to your org being able to roll out security capabilities. They're your stars, which means you have to be their hype person. All right, now to ICs. For ICs, many of us, uh, the struggle is real. Maybe you have an underdeveloped comms and leadership competency. I guess you would if you observe the following symptoms in yourself and your experiences. Maybe product and engineering don't include your security activities in their planning. Maybe they don't do any of your tickets. Maybe they push back. Maybe they make fun of your training if you're a person who does training, or they don't do training without you berating them. Um, so all this frustrates security people. We've all been there. So if you're frustrated and you're like, I need to go talk to them. I'm going to give them a piece of my mind. So you go to talk to them, and maybe because of the lack of communication and leadership experience you have, maybe you end up burying the lead, focusing on jargon or minutia, giving them a super long-winded explanation that only makes sense to security people, uh, or you give them 10, 10 times the amount of information that they actually need, and yet you're still not getting the message clearly across to them. So if this hurts a little bit, you know, maybe this also happens when you talk to senior leadership. I have been there. If this is you, there is hope. Um, you're probably already a very good engineer and just a bit frustrated, and just know that the gap between where you are and where you need to be is not huge. It just requires some consistent work from you in this area. Um, so one thing you can do is really just jointly work with your managers and build yourself that detailed career development plan. Don't wait for your manager. Like, you can help do some of this. Um, and that plan can grow the non-technical aspects of being a great engineer. This plan works alongside 
all of your existing projects anyway that span multiple quarters, which means you have multiple opportunities to work your Slack and email magic to get up in front of engineering and speak, and externally to speak at a meetup and or write in the company blog. So one thing to remember, it's like we're all bought into security because we're security people, but everyone else doesn't consistently do security stuff because it's the right thing to do, unfortunately. We all have to be sold, so work on your selling skills. Writing good plans that folks buy into like and have people read them, comment on them, bring up the hype, verbalize your plans frequently and crisply, and just continue to keep that hype level high. All right. So doing all this work, what does it get you? Um, I'll get to that in a minute. Um, but like this, the true benefit, at least from your manager's point of view, they'll look at you and they'll see that, hey, this person's adding power to their messaging this year by regularly speaking and writing. You know? And maybe you're like, shoot, this has been forcing me to continually refine my message and gain confidence. And confident messaging is what pushes people to do security work. Really, confident messaging gets people to do almost anything. So as people are starting to get security work done for you, you document what that work is and why it matters on Slack to see. So it's another way that you can keep the hype up. Like, thank you for the you know, platform team for doing X, Y, and Z in there. So this leads to higher job satisfaction because stuff is finally getting done in your org. For us at Segment, it created a virtuous cycle within product and engineering because folks actually listened to when our employees spoke and did the requested work instead of just avoiding it. Over time, product and eng happily did even more security work. It was something that we couldn't believe, but then quickly took advantage of. And then we spent less time on the basics that we hated, things like chasing down old vulns that nobody ever wants to fix. And we actually got to shift left in that organization. So like think about embedding with the eng teams to get projects done, getting to set up real preventative measures to avoid tons of new vulnerabilities from being generated in the first place. And a few of us, got to teach Eng how to do their own threat models, which is essentially like passing our security curse on to our friends in engineering. All right, tracking all of this. So finally, you're doing all this great work, but then how do you sort of like put it all together into a package? Uh, well, my suggestion for the first couple of years that you do this is just keep it really simple. Just keep, make it easy on yourself. At Segment, um, in the early days, with a security org that grew from like two to three people to 35. Um, I just created a, a confluence page that had a simple table and we just kept adding our blogs and talks to it. It just kept growing. And after a year, the table was huge. It was like a scrolling huge table because the crew there was just self-motivated and didn't need any micromanaging to, to present. Um, it was sweet as the CISO, I didn't have to work as hard. Um, this confluence page was then visible to all of segment. Everyone could see it. And then we'd hype somebody's latest efforts um, in the engine security Slack channels with links. We just wouldn't let any of that effort go to die. Um, at Twilio, so it's a little bit different there, um, with a security org of about 130 people and a different culture, we started using a small company called Discernible to help overcome the team's inertia on doing this type of work. So imagine how happy we were to have Discernible do all the heavy lifting for us to get folks moving. All that nudging that you would need to do as a leader or as a peer, like Discernible will help with that. So basically using their drop-in workflow, we could help our teammates through that entire engagement pipeline. So from thinking about what to talk about to like getting your CFP together, rehearsing, and then finally giving the speech, and then also metrics. Highly recommend this. It'll take some of the burden off of your shoulders. Okay. Imagine, now that you've done all this hard work, you've set up the framework for it, everybody's speaking, you're tracking it, and the team's collateral is like now being produced and counted. Ah, <sighs> what do we do then? There's more. Leaf will talk about how you can package up this work as an advertisement for how awesome your team is. So this is uh, some stats from a blog that I posted earlier this year. And as you can see, about two thirds of the people that went to the blog came from social. And so I recommend posting on social first and then sending the links to the social stuff to your team, so like LinkedIn, Twitter, whatever. Um, instead of having people individually post the underlying article, this will help you get some traction online. Uh, if somebody on your team writes something and they ask you to post for them, tell them no. Uh, we worked with somebody named Pablo at Twilio who said he didn't want to make a Twitter and wanted me to post for him. And I just told him, no, I'm not doing that. You, ha you have to make a Twitter and post yourself. 
and we'll all retweet you. Um, if you have a security Twitterati at your company, like Clint, uh, you can try to have them repost your stuff and uh, try to boost, boost things there. Um, but uh, you can also send this to groups on Slack or like send it to people individually. Just don't make sure, or make sure you're not spamming them because one of the goals of this is to improve your career and people uh, don't want to be spammed by people. So make sure it's a good fit for whatever the audience is. For me, I try to post stuff around 10 uh, between two, Tuesday and Thursday because most of my network is uh, within the United States. Uh, there's definitely a bias towards the West Coast, and so I found that that's a pretty good time where uh, people are online and have, have you know, gotten settled for the day, but it's not too late for people on the East Coast, uh, so you have plenty of time to get traction. This is from a different blog that I posted earlier in the year uh, on the segment site. And you can see that after the initial spike, uh, a lot of the like, later page views came from getting posted in Daniel Meisler's Unsupervised Learning and Clint's TLDR Sec, both great resources. So uh, check those out if you want to stay up to date on security news. But if your company has something like Google Analytics, try to get access to it just so you can see this information. It's pretty cool to see like, where traffic is coming from and um, like, you know, where, where it might be getting reposted. <laughs> If your company has uh, a sec slash security page, try to post some cool articles uh, that talk about your company's security program on there. Um, this is a good way to highlight people's work. It's also a good way for potential or current customers to learn about your security program in a positive way versus only hearing about it uh, after a security incident. I really like the design here from Figma, but no surprise that Figma has a well-designed site. Um, and then you can also do some things like add some pinned tweets or featured media on LinkedIn. This makes it easy for somebody who's looking you up, uh, maybe you know, a recruiter or somebody that wants to work with you, uh, to find your best stuff. Uh, they're not going to reach out and ask, hey, what's your best conference presentation? Um, and so having some stuff highlighted is really nice. By now, hopefully you're convinced that you and your team need to be doing this work. And you've heard some tips for the ways that you can create an environment to encourage this work. Um, and so now let's talk about some practical tips to actually make this stuff happen. In my opinion, everything starts with having a good outline. Um, you can really take an outline anywhere. Once you have an outline, it's a lot easier to start writing your blog. This is like writing down a project plan before you start work for the week or month or quarter. Uh, Colleen used to have a sticker on her laptop that said weeks of programming can save hours of planning. And I think that applies to stuff like this as well. It's a lot easier just to get the ordering right than try to move stuff around and have to change all of your transitions. And like, uh, I try to avoid that because it sucks. Um, once your blog's out, you might get some inbound interest from people that do podcasts. Um, and if not, that's totally fine. You can send it to some people that have podcasts that you think you might be a good fit for. Most podcast hosts are looking for guests. That's something that a lot of people don't realize. Uh, not like Patrick Gray from Risky Business. I'm sure he's inundated with people who want to be guests. But your average like me medium-sized podcaster is looking for good content. And so having somebody come inbound is, is very nice. Um, you can also take this outline and turn it into a CFP submission. And then you can turn it into a conference presentation, assuming that you get accepted. Similar to writing a blog with an outline, it's a lot easier to write uh, a conference presentation from an outline. And so having this outline is just really powerful throughout the whole process. Naturally, when you adapt a blog to a conference presentation, there's going to be stuff that you add or stuff that you admit, omit. But um, the general structure is probably going to be the same. And it's a lot easier to turn a blog into slides than turn nothing into slides. Some of my tips for outlining is write down everything that you think might be useful. Don't worry about the structure can be stats or quotes or just random ideas. Some parts of it might be really like well-written. Other parts are pretty exploratory. And I actually try to write things down as I'm working on them. And so sometimes the process of outlining actually takes like weeks or months uh, as a project is going. But it's a lot easier to think about this stuff and write it down than to go back and try to remember it. Um, Jerry Kaplan, the author of the book Startup, uh, would make audio recordings every week about what he did and then send them to a transcription service. Uh, this was in the like, late 80s or early 90s, so a little bit different time period. But uh, this served as like the source material for his book, which I thought was pretty cool. 
If your team isn't used to doing this kind of work at all, I think you probably need to do a little bit of foundational work. And the first step is to get people comfortable writing stuff down. If people aren't comfortable writing stuff down, it's a lot harder to get them to do outlines and blogs and all this stuff. And this has a benefit. Even if nobody writes a blog on your team, getting people in a documentation first culture is really helpful for getting people to agree on ideas outside of meetings and have people be able to uh, voice their opinions uh, and try to get a consensus before you have to even talk about something. Um, and it's also really important, especially with so many people working with people that are in different parts of the country or world even, um, writing things down is really helpful. It's also helpful looking back because you actually have the documents to show like why we did something or why we didn't do something. Another thing you can do is get people used to demoing. Uh, so we do team demos. No demo is too small. It, it could be a feature. It could be a spreadsheet. It could be a document. Anything can be a team demo. Uh, hopefully your team has a safe environment where people feel comfortable speaking. Um, and this is a good way to get people used to speaking in front of a, a larger audience. If you're, what you're working on is relevant to your whole company, maybe you could present it in all hands. Or maybe if your company is really big, uh, you have the concept of an internal conference. Uh, if you or somebody that you know says that you don't know what to write about, this is a, a very common problem. Um, but I think one thing that really helps is having a personal hype list of the stuff that you've been working on. Um, we could do a whole separate conversation about career development, but having a list of your accomplishments has a lot of benefits outside of blogging, makes it helpful for when you're coming to like annual review and promo time. It's also great if you end up like switching teams or switching managers and you have somebody who's now unfamiliar with your work, you can give them a list of the stuff you've been working on. Um, but another benefit is that you can use this to come up with what you should be writing or speaking about. If you don't have a hype list, just kind of think back over the last year, go through your JIRA tickets or linear tickets or your GitHub issues or GitHub pull requests or documents that you've created or even just kind of flip through your calendar and look at like what meetings you had and things like that. I think you can retroactively generate like a pretty decent hype list. And then you can use that to come up with stuff that you should be uh, telling the community about. Another thing that I hear commonly is the stuff I'm working on has already been talked about or blogged about. It, that does not matter. That is not a valid reason. Um, you had a unique experience working on this project. And you probably are working or thinking about things in a way that nobody else has thought about. And so sharing your unique story might be helpful to somebody else. Also, technology changes pretty quickly, even if the underlying problems often don't. And so giving an updated view of something that you know, maybe somebody talked about a year or two ago is, is very valuable. So don't let this hold you back. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is a lot of companies end up solving the same problems. And so uh, you know, that means that these things aren't figured out yet. So tell people what you were up to. I think the process of actually writing a blog is pretty author specific, so I'm not going to tell you like how to actually write the blog. But in my experience, helping people write blogs, once they have an outline and they're in the right mood, I think the content start to flow pretty quickly. And you can even work with them and say, like, hey, let's just do one section or like, let's do the next section. For me, personally, I find it easier to keep going than to get started. And so I actually write the majority of a blog in one sitting. So I probably get like 85% done. Um, like I get a pretty much a full draft done. Like it's definitely not a final draft, but I have like most of the ideas done. But uh, that's mostly just because that's uh, the best way for me to work. Some blog tips. Um, these are some things that we got uh, from somebody that used to work at Y Combinator, which runs Hacker News. They were giving feedback to somebody that was, had written a blog at Segment. Um, and I think that these are really helpful to keep in mind. The first one is be really intentional about whether it's a story or a tutorial. Tutorials are great, but the audience is generally limited to people that have the same problem. A story can appeal to people that are curious readers, even if they might never solve that same problem. The risk of a story, though, is if you don't hook somebody early, they're probably going to close the tab because they don't have that problem. Whereas a tutorial, they're probably going to keep reading because the end of the day, they still want to solve that problem. A good way to hook the reader early is to get them to feel the pain that you felt when you didn't have this thing that you built or this process. What you want to do is you want to get them to put themselves in your shoes. 
if your blog is just fun and hacky and interesting on its own, you can take a totally different approach. Uh, the example that this person gave was building a Turing machine out of Legos. I don't think you need to get somebody to feel the pain of not having a Lego Turing machine. Uh, you can just tell them about it because it's cool and interesting on its own. Um, but not every security topic is like that. Another thing is do not take readers on a direct, like, hey, we had this problem and here's how we solved it. They actually like a hero's journey. And so talking about unexpected challenges, setbacks, things like that can help you illustrate why you made the decisions that you made. It might be really obvious to the reader, hey, you know, like, you should have done X. It's like, well, I thought that was obvious too, and then I tried it, and it was actually a really bad idea. And here's why it didn't work out, and here's why we did things a different way. And so it can just get ahead of some of those types of like conversations and questions as well. As we transition from blogging to public speaking, I'm going to hand things back over to Colleen. Thank you. Well, I think on-stage presentations can be pretty scary, uh, whether you're experienced or not. And usually all of us need a bit of nudging to get up on stage. So you can think about doing a presentation in easy mode first to get you warmed up. In terms of prep, podcasts are much easier, in my opinion, than writing a blog or giving a presentation. So if you've already written something, um, whether it's an article at work or a blog or whatever it is, or you've given a talk, you can then start there and just massage the talking points that you already have. Easy, easy. Um, but if you don't have that, you can just work with the podcaster and create questions and like a desired direction that you want the interview to take. Um, then you just start filling in the answers to those questions. Um, as Leif mentioned before, everyone is dying for more content. The more content we all get, the more we want. And podcasters are trying to keep up with that need. So you pairing up with the podcaster, you're actually helping them. And so for you, benefit for you, it's a great practice in like a very low risk environment. If you're worried that you're gonna like lose your place, you're like, shoot, what were the answers that I came up with? then you can just have your notes up on screen right next to the podcaster's face. And so it looks like you're staring right at them, but you're also staring right at your notes. Hot tip. Um, and podcasting's fun. A lot of us in this room have done it. Uh, a lot of folks that you've talked to at B-Size probably have done some podcasts. You learn something from the podcast host, and they learn something from you, and you'll at least laugh one time. Um, and so with this low barrier entry, all you need is a topic, a quiet space, to talk and then like no unintended weird stuff behind you. You can have intended weird stuff behind you, that's fine, but no unintended weird stuff. And then how do you decide between like a live podcast versus a pre-recorded one? Each one has different benefits. So if you're the person who goes, God, what if I mess up? What if I use too many ums? What if I do something wrong? Then you wanna opt for the editable pre-recorded podcast because then you're good. But what if you're this person who goes, I don't want everyone at my company, particularly the legal department, crawling through every single minute of my spoken content that's horrible and cringy, then live might be better for you. Um, so in that case, you just basically share the proposed bullet points with your legal department. They do their redlining and stuff like that. And then all you need to do is just stick with the, the approved bullet points and you're good to go. As mentioned, as mentioned previously, uh, Colleen and I both have experience as CFP reviewers, and we've distilled down some of our best tips. Colleen has been a reviewer for B-Side San Francisco, and I've been a reviewer for APSA California and LocomocoSec. You should think of a CFP as having two audiences, the reviewers and the attendees of the conference. Reviewers might be looking at hundreds of CFPs, so it's important to make yours stand out because if reviewers don't like your CFP or they think another submitter has a stronger submission, uh, your audience will likely never see it. Once you've made it past that stage, you're still competing for attendees' time. How many tracks are there happening at this conference? You need to entice people to come to your uh, event specifically. Make sure that at least one person reviews the content before you submit it. It's good to get some feedback from somebody uh, you know, other than yourself. But at the end of the day, you're the one who's going to be up on stage. And so while you should consider the feedback, if you don't agree with it, don't do it just because somebody told you, because you're the one that has to deliver it. Try not to make too many changes after you've been accepted. But if you want to make some tweaks to your abstract, uh, I think that's usually OK. 
When you're thinking of titles, I think a little bit of clickbait is fine. There's a reason why articles have clickbait titles. It gets people's attention. Just don't go overboard. You want the reviewer and the attendees to actually know what you're going to talk about. If you have a bad first impression with the reviewer, which is your title, it can be hard to come back from that. Here are some common patterns for titles. I think a straightforward and description title is a classic. The reviewer and the attendees probably know if they want to go to that talk just based on the title. Uh, a fun and descriptive title is kind of just a twist on that, where it's like, hey, they're probably talking about cores. If you care about cores, you might be interested in that talk. And then you can also do what we did, where the first half is just nonsense. Like, that could be anything. But it probably got at least some of you interested. And then you follow up with what you're actually going to talk about. Some things to avoid in titles. Uh, if you have seen a lot of talks that have the same pattern of a title, think about how many more a CFP reviewer has seen, considering they see hundreds of talks. Um, and then avoid anything that's a sexual pun or innuendo. At LocoMocoSec, we just auto-reject these because we assume the author has bad judgment and is probably not an inclusive attendee. And while that's not always the case, we just can't afford to take the risk, and so we just don't accept them as a speaker. If you've never written an About You section, uh, take a look at some conference uh, bios from previous years. Uh, don't worry if the people on the schedule seem a lot more experienced than you. Everybody gave their first talk at some point, and some conferences like B-Sides Las Vegas even have uh, special help for new speakers. Um, some conferences ask for links to past talks. Uh, it's usually not in the About You section, but if you have some um, really good examples of podcasts or meetups or something, um, try to uh, showcase your best work. For your abstract, um, you want it to be short enough that people actually read it, but not so short that they have no idea what you're talking about. This can be a really difficult balance, but I think that people naturally tend to skim things over a certain size, so you, you, you do kind of need to optimize for that. Um, and again, this isn't just for the CFP reviewers like us, it's also for the attendees like yourselves. Um, you're competing for people to come to your talk, and sometimes you give a talk that's like two-thirds full, sometimes you give a talk that has a line out the door, uh, and I've been in both those situations, and that's just showbiz, baby. Um, here's a good example of an abstract from Global AppSec SF uh, last year. In this talk, we'll discuss scaling security programs through technology and secure by default in an evolving engineering ecosystem. We'll share lessons learned from paving roads for security over the years, how to find opportunities, create shared accountability with engineering partners, and ultimately reduce security risks. This was from a keynote um, by Anna. Uh, just go see a talk if it's by Anna. You can just skip the abstract, but um, I think this is, does a really good job of illustrating what the talk is about, and people should have a pretty good idea if it's going to be useful to them just based on the abstract. Some conferences require an outline. Other ones don't. Um, as you might have guessed at this point, I'm a big fan of having an outline, and so even if a conference doesn't require one, I recommend making one anyway. I think it's going to give you a leg up on people that don't write one because you're going to write a better abstract, which helps you write a good title. Uh, outlines are typically not shared with attendees, and so this is really just for CFP reviewers. You don't have to worry about that dual audience component the way that you do with everything else. But this is really your last impression with a reviewer because um, you want to show them, hey, I've done enough research on this thing that I'm qualified, but again, you don't want to make it like a whole talk. Uh, you want them to just be able to see that you're going to talk about some great stuff. If your outline is really short, uh, it can come across as lazy, so make sure that you have like some minimum length. Similar to blogging, or uh, you, you want to have somebody peer review your CFP submission. Um, make sure that you don't hire yes men for this task. You want someone who's actually going to give you real feedback here. And um, again, like you don't have to incorporate everything, but uh, just try to think if it makes sense to include. Oh, and then uh, Colleen's going to give you some tips on making the jump to delivering your first talk. OK, how are we doing on time? I think we have five minutes. Oh, all right. Speedy. OK, uh-oh, don't panic. Your talk has been accepted. But by now, you've been making notes on things that you'd like to include in future material, right? Taking notes. I see a few of you taking notes, which is good. 
Um, maybe you've even captured some clever turns of phrases and you're like, oh, that sounds good, I gotta write that down. All of that is good motion. But here's something to consider throughout this entire section. If you can write and deliver a good meetup or conference talk, you can write and deliver a good keynote. You can be tapped for all three. To me, the difference between the talk types is kind of like the difference between a tall, a grande, and a venti, because I am that basic. All three talks start with outlines, have a beginning, a middle, and an end. They all zoom in, and they provide specific examples that illustrate your point. They all tell a story or a tutorial, um, and they get an, an important message across. In fact, content between all different types of talk formats is very similar. What's more is all of LEAF's previous tips and tricks work for them as well. And if you've been actually actively using them, you're between 50 to 80% done, hype list. The process now is just keep iteratively filling in that outline and then manage the crap out of yourself. So your meetup talk is like a tall size drink, maybe even shorter, like a short or a demi or whatever it is, not that I don't know. Um, if you've been doing security for at least one year, you already have a topic that you should be talking about. Not only that, but there's just a meetup just down the street from you, and they're desperate for new blood, because what happens is the same folks rotate in quarter after quarter, and they want a new person to show up, and that's you. And if your company can host the meetup, even better, because the host gets a speaking spot, which means you can bypass the entire acceptance process, which is very easy mode, recommend that. Um, meetups all have a lower barrier to entry. You can even do a short lightning talk, five to 15 minutes. It can be an advertisement for a blog or an article. It could be a recap of a project that you just did. Um, and some other topic ideas that we've seen could be like security tools that you've built or processes that you've implemented, educational talk based on something you had to learn for work and that you wanted to share. Like we had to just do a bunch of research on OAuth or JWTs for an internal project and we're here to share our learnings, easy. You can give a predictions of the future talk or even an inspirational talk like ours that lightly educates, but mostly just pushes people into doing something positive. Um, and for your meetup or lightning talk, keep it on the shorter side and lean into high impact visuals because you just don't have a lot of time. Visuals matter. For the longer and more formal types of talks, all the previous topics um, are still applicable. But just like with your meetup, the work is filling in that outline. Um, and you can do that now on paper, audio notes, or start moving your outline over to some slides and then it becomes really real. And for conference talks, you can also consider doing like a joint presentation. Are you finding that you're too busy to really just take this on by yourself? Maybe you're too unfocused to finish slides. That's fine, usually. Um, and to cut down on the overall amount of work that you need to do and just make it fun, consider co-presenting. Your co-presenter can help you, thank you, give you uh, content, organize it, practice it with you, and give you a break when you're on stage so you can reap the benefits of being on a two-person team. Um, if you're doing it by yourself and you're really struggling, the key is just keep going. Just keep pushing yourself and filling in that outline and reward yourself handsomely for every couple of hours of concentrated work that you do. You deserve it. So your keynote, it's 95% similar to any other talk that you would write except the main difference is your panic level goes through the roof. Of course you can reuse parts of a previous talk. Just ensure that the topic is gonna to be like 80% of your mixed audience, like will be able to appreciate and understand it. Um, folks that attend your keynote, think about like they're all from every single type of domain, every single skill level. It could be their first day in security, they could be 20 years in security, and any domain. And when filling in the outline, the one extra thing you need to remember for a keynote is You've zoomed all the way in and you've given details, but now you need to zoom all the way out and make the connection um, between at least one of the main drivers of your speech and then one of the main drivers of the conference. That's plugging those things in makes the keynote. And uh, while you're sweating through it, it's normal to go back and forth on wording, graphics, ordering, all of it. Um, you're gonna fiddle with your talk until your deadline hits. That is normal. If that happens to you, you're 100% normal. Um, and while you're fiddling with your talk, you can like go take a break, procrastinate, and then go pick out like your version of the Steve Jobs power outfit. Something to do. No matter what size speech you're giving, please practice it at least five times out loud and have an audience for at least one of those. Even though you don't want any of your coworkers, family or friends creeping on you, watching you, criticizing you, they will pick up on problems and missed opportunities in your speech. It's super helpful, even though it's cringy, just do it. They'll point out, where am I being super confusing? 
where am I failing to make a big impact? And if it's a keynote, they're like, hey, aren't you supposed to like zoom out and do the thing? And you're like, ah, oh, I didn't do it well. So 99% of this test feedback is gonna be useful to you in some way. So before you get up on stage, somebody helping you out is a gift. Take advantage of it. I would say just skip this one. All right. Yeah. This one's just a quick one if you get very nervous. Here's a link to uh, how to manage adrenaline. All right, and to wrap up our presentation and to give you some tips to walk away with, remember these points. All of this is really important to help you build your dream team and support efforts once they're working with you. Accounting for and tracking all the things is important. Always, always build and fill in that outline. It is key to everything you do. Clickbait works, but do not be creepy. And remember to use your network to promote your work. Finally, all talks are basically the same and you can learn some calming techniques to help you when your nerves kick in. Cool, so thanks for attending our talk. Uh, we'll be around for the next hour or so. We'd love to hear about what you wanna speak about and uh, how it helps your security team. And if we miss one another, uh, we're in various security community slacks as well as on Twitter. Um, and so I'll be hanging out at the SEMGREP booth, which is, again is on the other side, but yeah, we have a link to the slides. I also wrote a couple of blogs about this earlier this year that has this down in like written form. So um, yeah, appreciate everyone uh, coming out and supporting us today. Thanks.